Well, guys, it's great to be with you all together. Uh, this was uh, just uh, an idea, a spur of the moment thing. And um, uh, Preston, Rich, and I, uh, we're totally unified. And we're just excited to uh, pull all of our churches together as family in the PNW to, to really highlight the things that God's doing and get excited about the future and what God wants to do. It's so great to always be with the PNW family. Um, you know, right now we have disciples signed in from all over the Northwest, and I hope that you're fired up about what God is doing. You know, May was an incredible month for all of our churches. We're all very close to our missions goals, and God has really been blessing the churches with some incredible baptisms and restorations, as you see today. And uh, I do just want to uh, take a moment to uh, congratulate Janet Welcome back, sis. It's great to have you in the fellowship. Um, you know, Courtney and I pray for uh, all the disciples in the Northwest every day, and uh, we're just so thankful that God has brought us out here and allowed us to be uh, a part of this incredible spiritual family. You know, this today is a very important service. Um, June is the last push for our missions contribution uh, prayerfully, this summer will be full of fun and fruit, and God will continue to bless our ministries. You know, currently right now, in the Pacific Northwest, we have, uh, we have 162 disciples. And I don't know about you, but uh, I've got this vision of climbing all the way up to 200 disciples very soon. And I really pray and hope that we all can gain that vision and, of course, work toward it and pray for it. Lord willing, in August, uh, I will be graduating from the International College of Christian Ministry with my master's degree. Now, this is, an, this is an important accomplishment for me. It's something I've actually been working on since 2013, on and off. Uh, but I'm very excited about that. And the lesson that we're going to go through today is actually based on some study that I've been doing for my master's thesis. So the title of our message this morning is Jehovah Jireh. And we'll talk about what that means in just a little bit. But let's start in Genesis chapter 13. I really believe that in order to understand the sacrifice of Isaac in Genesis 22, we need to understand who Abraham was. And to really truly understand who Abraham was, we need to understand his relationship with his nephew, Lot. Let's begin our reading here in Genesis 13 and verse 1. So Abram went up from Egypt to the Negev with his wife and everything he had, and Lot was with him. Abram had become very wealthy in livestock and in silver and gold. From the Negev, he went from place to place where, until he came to Bethel, to the place between Bethel and Ai, where his tent had been earlier, and where he had first built an altar. There Abram called on the name of the Lord. Now Lot, who was moving about from Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents. But the land could not support them while they stayed there. So their possessions were so great that they were not able to stay together. And quarreling arose between Abram's herdsmen and the herdsmen of Lot. The Canaanites and Perizzites were also living in the land at the time. So Abram said to Lot, Let's not have any quarreling between you and me, or between your herdsmen and mine, for we are brothers. Is not the whole land before you? Let's part company. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. If you go to the right, I'll go to the left. Lot looked up and saw that the whole plain of the Jordan was well watered, like the garden of the Lord like the land of Egypt toward, toward Zor. That is before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot chose for himself the whole plain of the Jordan and set out toward the east. The two men parted company. Abram lived in the land of Canaan, while Lot lived among the cities of the plain and pitched his tents near Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked and were sinning greatly against the Lord. The Lord said to Abram after Lot had parted from him, lift up your eyes from where you are and look to the north and south, the east and west. All the land that you see, I will give you and your offspring forever. I will make your offspring like the dust of the earth, so that if anyone could count the dust, then your offspring could be counted. Go, 
Walk through the length and breadth of the land, for I am giving it to you. So Abram moved his tents and went to live near the great trees of Mamre at Hebron, where he built an altar to the Lord. You know, Abram and Lot had a very special relationship. The Bible says here that Abram had become very wealthy and that he was traveling about and Lot, his nephew, was with him. Later on, Abram considers their relationship like that of brothers. And so although they were not biological father and son, we can conclude that they had what we might call a father-son relationship. And their men are arguing. The herdsmen are going back and forth, and they realize, you know what? We just need to split. We've, we've accumulated all of this stuff and these animals. It's about time we get our own property. And so they look at the land. It's beautiful. It's well-watered. And, and Abram looks at it. And he goes, Lot, why don't you go to the left, and I'll go to the right? But if you want to go to the right, I'll go to the left. And he gives them the option. He considers him better than himself. And what ends up happening is kind of humorous. Lot looks at the right and he looks at the left and he goes, Abram, actually, I think I'll just take all of it. So why don't you go figure something else out? And so Abram gladly does so. And he walks away and you can tell it kind of hit him. Because, because then God comes to him and God had to call Abram to look up. He says, lift up your eyes in verse 14. You know, he's, he's kind of downcast. He's a little bit down. He, he thought they were going to share some land. Even though it was going to be separate, he thought they were going to be closer together. But Abram conceded all of the land to Lot, his son. And then he, of course, was taken away by the Lord to a different, different area. What an incredible heart of generosity and self-sacrifice Abram had. Well, in chapter 14, there's a battle going on in the plains. There's nine kings involved, four against five, and Lot got caught up in the battle. In fact, they take all of his possessions and they kidnap him. Meanwhile, Abram has settled down somewhere else, but one of the servants escapes from the battle and he finds Abram and he tells him what happened. Let's read on in chapter 14 and verse 14. When Abram learned that his relative had been taken captive, he called out the 318 men, trained men born in his household, and they went in pursuit as far as Dan. During the night, Abram divided his men to attack and to attack them, and he routed them, pursuing them as far as Hobah near Damascus. He recovered all the goods and brought back his relative Lot and his possessions, together with the women and the other people. Now, this is incredible. Abram puts the lives of 318 trained men at risk to rescue this one person, his nephew, his son, Lot. You know, Abram had a whatever-it-takes attitude, and he was willing to risk it all just to save one person. That might sound familiar. Let's go to chapter 15. Let's see how God responds to Abram's faith in action. Chapter 15 and verse 1. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. How did you come out of that battle unscathed? I was there. I protected you. I am your great reward. Verse 2. But Abram said, O sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who, who will inherit my estate is Eleazar of Damascus. And Abram said, you have given me no children. So a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir, but a son coming from your own body will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look up at the heavens and count the stars. If indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Abram believed the Lord and it was credited to him as righteousness. Abram had a faithful heart. He was blessed by God because he had already proven faithful. You see, God promised him a son of his own because he was trustworthy with a son as he had proved with Lot. And so from there, God would make him 
and his offspring into an entire nation because of his faithfulness. You know, sometimes we want God to give us more. We want more out of life. But the question is, have you proved faithful like Abraham? Did you show yourself trustworthy in those moments of time when God was putting you to the test? You see, Abraham's faith was obvious. And so long before Genesis 22, Abraham believed that the Lord would provide for him and his family. Now, let's fast forward. 25 years later, Abraham is 100 years old. Look in Genesis chapter 21, verse 1. Now the Lord was gracious to Sarah, as he had said, and the Lord did for, did for Sarah what he had promised. Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age at the very time God had promised him. You know, to us, we read this and we go, oh my gosh, 25 years later, that's how long it took for the promise to come true. And we, we think the timing is off. Maybe we think the timing is awful because it took 25 years for God's promise to come true. And that's a long time. But you see, to Abraham, God's timing was perfect because the Bible says it was at the very time God had promised him. And that's really how we've got to view God's timing in our lives. It's at just the right time. You know, these circumstances here in chapter 21 lead us to believe that the birthplace of Isaac was here in Beersheba, as you see, as you see at the end of the chapter, which is, of course, Philistine territory. But God would soon test Abraham's heart. Now let's read Genesis 22, verse 1. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and saddled his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place that God had told him about. What we read here is very interesting. Because now he's got his son. How old is his son? Well, we don't really know. I mean, it just says sometime later. So maybe we need to fill in the blanks a little bit. He goes to Mount Moriah. Well, where is Mount Moriah? Well, maybe the Lord wants us to figure it out. So let's start to figure that out. Jump ahead with me to verse 14. This whole situation happens, which we'll read about in a little bit. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day, it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. Now that's awesome. That's awesome. We need to find out where this mountain is. I mean, if we go to this mountain and it's there that the Lord will provide, don't you want to come with me? I mean... The word right here that we see for the Lord is Jehovah Jireh. It means the Lord will provide. And it was on this mountain. Which mountain? Moriah? Not necessarily. The mountain of the Lord that it will be provided. Join me. Let's find this mountain. Amen. The mountain of the Lord. Let's continue reading. At the very beginning of the chapter, verse 3. Again, we read. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and saddled his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place that God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. You know, we get a few clues right here. Number one, they had to leave early in the morning. Why? Well, they're expecting to do a lot of walking. Have you ever gone on a, on a long walk or a hike? Typically, what you want to do is leave early in the morning. You, you beat the heat of the day. 
and you just get a head start. Now, personally, I've walked 25 miles in a day and I still had a little gas for a little bit more. It's very doable. So what we need to appreciate, though, the fact that they're carrying wood. I mean, so much so they need a donkey to carry the wood. They probably got some other supplies. So let's estimate that they were planning on walking about 20 miles per day. And interestingly, in verse 4, it tells us that it was on the third day that they saw the mountain, Mount Moriah. So we can estimate that it was probably about 50 to 60 miles or so away. But that still doesn't really tell us exactly where it is. Now, there's only one other passage of Scripture that talks about Mount Moriah. Let's go to 2 Chronicles chapter 3. I hope you guys can appreciate a little Bible study this morning. I'm sure you've had incredible quiet times. You've learned a lot already. But I love growing in my knowledge of the scriptures, and I hope you do too. In 2 Chronicles chapter 3 and verse 1, it says, Then Solomon began to build the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah. Now that's awesome. Now that tells us that in Jerusalem there is a Mount Moriah. But you know, there's a lot of scriptures that use the same names, the same places, or so it seems. And it's, it's hard to really tell if they're exactly the same. I mean, you, you'll see multiple times in scriptures, people with the same name. But is this the same Mount Moriah that Abraham went to? I mean, there is no reference to Abraham here in the passage. Well, I believe that it is. You see, in Jerusalem... There was the temple, which was called Mount Zion. And you go, well, Mount Zion, now where did that come from? Well, you see, Zion is actually a small cluster of three mountains. You got Mount Zion to the west, Mount Moriah in the middle, and the Mount of Olives to the east, all comprising Zion. Now, Mount Zion, we understand from Scripture, is the mountain of the Lord. So then the question becomes, well, is the Mount Moriah here the same as the Mount Moriah where Abraham sacrificed Isaac? Well, on a map, it's 55 miles walking from Beersheba to this place. And so we can conclude that, yes, it was the same place that Abraham uh, uh, sacrificed Isaac that they later built the temple under Solomon. Isn't that incredible? You know, we, we understand that on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. Now, let's see how the Lord provides for Abraham in Genesis chapter 22. You've heard me reference the sacrifice of Isaac, and so let's read about it here, starting in verse 6. Abraham took the wood from the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife as the two of them went on together. Isaac spoke up and said to his father, his father, Abraham, father. Yes, my son. Abraham replied, the fire and the wood are here. Isaac said, but where's the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place that God had told them about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am. He replied, do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God, because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son, which we know as Isaac. Abraham looked up and there in the thicket saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the place the Lord will provide. And to this day, it is said on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. Now, my thesis is not all what you're reading right here you see right here the emphasis is really on the faith of abraham as it should be 
my thesis that I'm writing for the master's program is more so based on who Isaac was. And of course, we know him to be the son of Abraham. But can you imagine the faith that it took Isaac to lay upon the altar? To not squirm away as he sees the tip of the knife. Hold your spot here and look over in Genesis chapter 31. I want to read this really inspiring passage to you in verse 42. It's just a quick side note. If the God of my father, the God of Abraham, and the fear of Isaac had not been with me, you would surely have sent me away empty handed. You know, we see something really interesting here. The only time in all of scripture that God is referred to as the fear, capital F, is in, in reference to his relationship to Isaac. Now, back in Genesis 22, if you're Isaac and you're laying on the altar, perhaps the, the moment of this situation you would have never forgotten was the angel saying to your father Abraham, now I know that you fear God. You know, I believe that Isaac gained a conviction on this day to have a true faith in God, to fear God, to trust God, because it is God who always provides. Now, it's interesting here. You know, in burnt offerings, according to other passages, it was the liver and the kidneys that were burned. They were, they, they're typically surrounded by fat, which is the portion that God really appreciates. But the liver and the kidneys are two organs that the body uses to filter blood. Now, I'm not sure what's going on right there. I'm sure this is beyond me, but I feel like God is up to something right there in the burnt offering. You know, in the same moment that Abraham has the knife raised, Isaac is staring at the tip of the knife. And the angel of the Lord suddenly speaks, Abraham, Abraham. Now, this whole experience would have just would, would have would have completely happened in slow motion. Now, we don't know exactly how old Isaac was. I know some of us picture this as he is the son, perhaps as a little boy. But you got to consider a few things. Number one, he was strong enough to carry wood up a mountain. So I give him at least 15 years old or so. But he's also less than 37 because in the chapter following, his mother, Sarah, dies at 127 years old. And she gave birth to him when she was 90. So I think that it's safe to conclude that Isaac was probably somewhere in between 15 years old and 37 years old. And let me just say this. I wouldn't put it past God for a moment that Isaac was somewhere around the same age as Jesus about 33 years old when he laid on the altar. You know, Abraham was really about to do it. I mean, he had the knife, he had the wood, he had the supplies, he had the torch, he had the altar, and he had his son. And he was actually going to sacrifice his one and only son, Isaac. And the Bible reads in Genesis chapter 11 that Abraham was okay with that because he reasoned that God could raise the dead. You see, he had faith, even from the get-go, that God would provide, even if it wasn't a ram, he could provide a resurrection. Miraculously, the Lord provides a ram in the thicket that both Abraham and Isaac could sacrifice together. You know, have you ever been, a, been about to do something, and at the moment, God just forces you to stop? You know, I'll never forget in college one day, we were on our way to church on a Sunday morning, and we came to a rolling stop to a stop sign, my car load. And you ever, you ever kind of get distracted and, and you're moving forward, don't even realize it? You're, maybe your foot's off the, the brake a little lighter than you thought. And that was our situation. And we're kind of all sitting there, we're talking, we're getting ready for church, and you know, we're, we're, we're excited to, uh, to, to, to worship and fellowship. And we're just, we're just slowly creeping without re realizing it, out into the intersection. 
Now, the cross streets had, had no stop signs, so we were just waiting to turn right. And I'll never forget the moment the car suddenly stopped, and at the same time it stopped, a bus came zooming by inches from the, the car shook from, from the movement of the bus, and we were in complete shock. And of course, grateful that God saved our lives. You know, this was one of those moments where God just forced the stop to save them from danger. See, the question isn't, is God trying to stop us? Is, is God providing? I believe that he is for those that are faithful. But do you listen? Do you, do you hear your name? Do you respond? Do you stop and respond? Here I am. When you sin, in the moment, you're so caught up in the moment. You know that it's wrong, but do you stop and do you listen to your name? Here I am. You know, it's almost like in his faithfulness, Abraham expected it. He was hoping for it. You know, my hope and prayer this morning is that we will learn to trust God completely with everything in our lives. To the day that this was written, the Bible says that the Lord would provide on the mountain of the Lord. And I believe that to this day, the Lord will provide for those that are faithful. And so I've got three points for you this morning. That was just the introduction. Point number one, God provides the plan of salvation. Now, I want us to note here that just like Jesus, the one and only son of God, Abraham and Isaac, nearly paralleled the crucifixion of Jesus. So here are seven parallels that I found, and perhaps you could find more. Number one, the father leads his son to be sacrificed. If you hold your spot here and look over in Acts chapter 22, or Acts chapter 2, verse 22, says, men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. It was God's plan all along. It was his, it was his plan all along. He had the foreknowledge, and he led Jesus the same way that Abraham led Isaac. Number two, Isaac and Jesus were both one and only sons born of a miracle. Isaac was born to Sarah at 90 years old, and Jesus was more born to Mary, who was a virgin. Number three, both of the sacrifices take place in Zion. Abraham and Isaac on Mount Moriah, or the Temple Mount, as you read about in the New Testament. Jesus, just outside the walls of Jerusalem, but still Zion nonetheless. Number four, the companions of Isaac and the disciples of Jesus stayed behind for the sacrifice. The servants stayed at the base of the mountain. Jesus' disciples fled because they were afraid. Number five, Isaac and Jesus both carried the wood. Isaac's wood was for the burnt offering. Jesus carried the patibulum, which was the crossbar of the cross. Number six, both sacrifices contained substitutes. The ram was the substitute for Isaac, and Jesus was the substitute for us. Both Isaac's and Jesus' sacrifices were demonstrations of the Father's love. Abraham loved God and therefore was obedient to him. And I find it interesting that the angel Notes to Abraham, because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. And of course, John chapter 3, verse 16 says, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. You see, the plan of salvation is clear. From the Old Testament, we need to have a thorough understanding because it's paralleled to the New Testament. We can't be intimidated by the Old Testament because it's, it's perhaps, you know, just so large in size, but rather inspired to know that it's 
full of history, and God wants us to be students of the Bible in its entirety. Clearly, the plan of salvation was the sacrifice of Jesus. Jehovah Jireh, God provided the plan of salvation. Point number two, God provides the place of salvation. Let's go back to 2 Chronicles chapter 3. Verse 1, then Solomon began to build the temple of the Lord in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah, where the Lord had appeared to his father David. It was the threshing floor of Aruna, the Jebusite, the, pla the place provided by David. He began building on the second day of the second month in the fourth year of his reign. The foundation Solomon laid for building the temple of God was 60 cubits long and 20 cubits wide. And it goes on to tell us the dimensions and all of the extravagant things that God had provided for his temple under Solomon. So let's jump ahead to chapter 5 and verse 1. When all the work of Solomon had done for the temple of the Lord was finished, he brought in the things that his father David had dedicated, the silver and the gold and all the furnishings, and he placed them in the treasuries of God's temple. Then Solomon summoned to Jerusalem, the elders of Israel, all the heads of the tribes and the chiefs of the Israelite families to bring up the ark of the Lord's covenant from Zion, the, the city of David. And all the men of Israel came together to the temple, I'm sorry, to the king at the time of the festival in the seventh month. When all the elders of Israel had arrived, the Levites took up the ark and they brought up the ark in the temple tent of meeting and all the, the sacred furnishings in it. The priests and all who were Levites carried them up. And King Solomon and the entire assembly of Israel that had gathered about him were before the ark, sacrificing so many sheep and cattle that they couldn't be recorded or counted. Wow, isn't this incredible? It was there on Mount Moriah that the Lord would provide the place of salvation. Isn't it incredible that they sacrificed so many sheep and cattle that they lost count. And we know that the authors of the Bible could count really, really high. I mean, in Numbers 26, they counted 601,730 fighting men in the census. In Numbers 31, they counted in the spoils 675,000 sheep. So how many sheep was this? Probably at least that many. This was a major sacrifice. You know, I know right now all over the PNW, we are making major sacrifices for the kingdom of God and missions. You know, in Seattle, one campus brother gave over $3,900. All of our single mothers have already given over $1,700. So many other stories are here in, in Portland and Eugene. And I want you to know that God appreciates all of our sacrifices. Let's continue reading in verse 12. All the Levites who were musicians, Asaph and Heman and Jedithan and their, their sons and relatives stood on the east side of the altar, dressed in fine linen and playing cymbals, harps, and lyres. They were accompanied by 120 priests sounding trumpets. The trumpeters and singers joined in unison as with one voice to give praise and thanks to God. Accompanied by trumpets, cymbals, and other instruments, they raised their voices and praised the Lord and saying, He is good, his love endures forever. Then the temple of the Lord was filled with the cloud, and the priests could not perform their service because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the temple of God. You know, the celebration surrounding the altar was unbelievable. The music, the dancing, the sacrifice, the hearts of the people were so grateful and therefore rejoiced, kind of like our church services that we've been missing out on. But you know, when you're grateful, you're joyful. And as a Christian, we have so much to be grateful for, the least of which is our salvation. Thank God he provided a place for our salvation. Chapter 7, verse 1. When Solomon finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. The priest could not enter the temple of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled it. When all the, when all the Israelites 
saw the fire coming down and the glory of the Lord above the temple. They knelt down on the pavement with their faces to the ground and they worshiped and gave thanks to the Lord saying, he is good. His love endures forever. Then the king and all the people offered sacrifice before the Lord and King Solomon offered a sacrifice of 22,000 head of cattle and 120,000 sheep and goats. So the king and all the people dedicated the, the, the temple of God. The priests took their possessions, as did the Levites with the Lord's musical instruments, which King David had made for, for praising the Lord, and which were used when he gave thanks, saying, His love endures forever. Opposite, the Levites and the priests blew their trump trumpets, and all the Israelites were standing. I mean, we see right here, it is a party going on in Jerusalem. But you know what? The party continues in verse 11. When Solomon had finished the temple of the Lord in the royal palace and, the, and, and succeeded in carrying out all that he had in mind to do with the temple of the Lord and in his own palace, the Lord appeared to him at night and said, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a temple for sacrifices. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command locusts to devour the land or send a plague among my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. You know, right now, our nation is in, in a place where it needs healing. And God says right here, I will heal if you would be unified, if you would humble yourself, if you would look to me and stop looking at the media and stop looking at the problems, but you look to me and I will forgive the sins. I will heal the land. Verse 15, he says, Now my eyes will be opened and my ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. I have chosen and consecrated the temple so that my place or so that my name will be there forever. My eyes and my heart will always be there. You know, it's incredible that God would be so genuinely concerned for the welfare of mankind. Right now, surrounding us is evidence of man's sinfulness, but also God's holiness and the holiness of his kingdom. The racial divide of our nation, the corruption of different authorities, the hatred being exposed in people's hearts. Though I'm saddened by the state of the world, I can honestly say I have never been more grateful for the kingdom of God. I have never appreciated the unity and the opportunity and the diversity of the kingdom of God. This is the place that God led me for salvation. The kingdom of God is the place for salvation. You know, I'm so fired up about the state of the PNW churches. The leaders are focused. Everybody is giving generously from their hearts. The disciples are considering each other and supporting each other through these hard times. I believe that there is really no group more diverse and more unified than the kingdom of God around the world. You know, truly, as it says here in verse 15, God says, my eyes are open. My ears are attentive to the prayers that we send up to heaven. He says, I will forgive the sins. And we've seen so many have their sins forgiven during this dark time of the pandemic. We need to praise God that he provided a place for salvation. Point number three, our final point, God provides the perfect salvation. Let's go to Luke chapter 22. Luke 22 and verse 39. Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives. Remember, this is the third mountain just east of Jerusalem. And his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, Take this cup from me, yet not as I will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared in anguish. He prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like drops of blood falling to the ground. 
when he heard, when he rose from prayer and went back to the disciples, he found them asleep, exhausted from sorrow. Why are you sleeping? He asked them, get up and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. So here Jesus is, just east of Jerusalem. He traveled down through the valley to the Mount of Olives, still technically the mountain of the Lord, Zion. Now the Mount of Olives is 2,684 feet high. It's skies over Jerusalem. But this night, Jesus isn't at the peak. He's not praying over the city, gaining vision for all the disciples to come. He's at the foot of the mountain in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he's praying and he's in anguish. And his desire to die is inexistent. His willingness to die is diminishing. His capillaries in his forehead are bursting and his sweat became like drops of blood. He needed strength from God. And God sends an angel to strengthen him. He was asking God for a ram in the thicket. He goes, Lord, in the same way you provided for Abraham, please take this from me. Give me a ram in the thicket. Don't, don't make me do this, Lord. You know, in Hebrews chapter 12, the Bible says that Jesus was the perfecter of our faith. Why? Because he was perfect. He was without sin. But to really appreciate his perfection, you really need to appreciate and understand his humanity. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, the Bible says that Jesus was tempted in every way. And then later in chapter 5 and verse 2, it says that Jesus himself was subject to weakness. You know, Jesus, right here, takes away all of our excuses. Jesus can sympathize with you, but he never gave in to sin. Now, I've got to ask you, and we've got to ask ourselves, how easy is it for you to sin? How do you feel after you sin? Is there a godly sorrow like we read about in 2 Corinthians 7 or a worldly sorrow? You see, someone who understands the grace of God fights, wrestles, struggles, and resists their sin. This is what the Bible teaches. Now, amazingly, there are seven parallels that are found between Isaac and Jesus, the perfecter of our faith, the perfect salvation. Number one. You know, Isaac and Jesus, they both asked the father questions. Isaac said, where's the lamb for the sacrifice? Jesus said, may this cup be taken from me. Is there any other way? Can you please provide a ram in the thicket like you did for Abraham? Secondly, both Isaac and Jesus submitted to the will of the father. Isaac got on the altar, saw the tip of the knife. Jesus prayed, saw the tip of the knife. Yet he prayed for a surrendered heart. Isaac was surrendered. Your will be done. Number three, both of the fathers believed in the resurrection. Abraham reasoned with God in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 19, that God could raise the dead. And God, of course, had planned Jesus' resurrection from the very beginning. Number four, both of the sons were laid upon the wood and then bound to the wood. Isaac on the altar, Jesus on the cross. The ram was caught by his horns in the thicket. Jesus wore a crown of thorns on his head. Number six, both sons ultimately survived the sacrifice. Jesus is alive and well, amen? And number seven, perhaps my favorite insight Isaac went up on the mountain and survived the sacrifice on the third day, just like Jesus raised on the third day. You know, God has been connecting the Old Testament and the New Testament, the history to the present for a long time. You know, excitingly, 
we as disciples in the 21st century are living examples that our churches are modeled after those in the first century. And this summer, it's very exciting. We are very privileged because we get to send some of our best disciples out to advance the gospel. Very excitingly, this summer, we'll be sending Russell Fox and Sarah Rudberg to Chicago to be full-time interns. Jack Merritt will be moving to Chicago also to be an intern. Rich and Delaney Noches are moving to Portland to be full-time in the ministry. Tylesha Graham is moving to Minneapolis to be a part of the church planting there. David and said I.E. Ridestead will also be moving to Minneapolis to be a part of that church planting. Jesse Owen will be moving from Eugene down to San Diego to be a part of a supplemental church planting. Now, it's very exciting what God is doing. I hope you are fired up about the things that God is doing. You know, I'm very excited to announce that in Seattle, we are going to be splitting the church into three regions, perhaps more down the road. The East region will be led by Jesse and Gina Rudder, Jesse Lane and Gina Rudder. The downtown region will be led by Zach and Brittany Miller. And the north region will be led by my wife, Courtney, and me. You know, prayerfully, I'm really praying that God will open some doors and we will be able to plant the Tacoma region very soon. You know, in closing, we really need to understand that God is Jehovah Jireh and he's always provided. He always has provided and he always will provide for those of us who remain faithful to him. God provided the plan of salvation. Jesus had to die on the cross for our sins. He died on the cross for your sins. And out of that, God wants a response. He wants us to respond to that, to follow in his footsteps and be the Christians that the Bible calls us to be. Secondly, he provided a place of salvation. Zion was, of course, the physical kingdom and the place of salvation for them. But now we rejoice because the kingdom is spiritual and it is the place of salvation. We need to rejoice today that we have found the kingdom of God, the church of God. Amen. God provided the perfect salvation. You see, Jesus from the very beginning was always part of the plan. He was always, the place was always determined and his perfection was realized and he became the perfect sacrifice. And because of him, we have hope. You know, in Seattle, we're really praying that every Bible talk will be fruitful by June 20th. And I believe that Lord willing throughout the PNW, June and July are going to be our greatest months yet. As we continue to see the kingdom of God uh, advance, that we see God do miracles and move powerfully all throughout our family of churches. You know, God provided for Abraham and he provided for Israel. And he provided for Jesus. And he provided for the first century church. And I'm telling you that he will provide for you if only you believe in Jehovah Jireh. Amen? To God be the glory and to us the joy.